Jules, welcome back to the show. Before the break, we are talking about this very sad and tragic case of Mr. Nguyen and QB Insurance Limited. Let's go to the basic facts. What happened in this case, Alice? Tony, this is a case where a fellow became a paraplegic after suffering a stabbing injury and essentially what he did was sue the security company who was responsible for providing security on the night. And then it gets a little bit technical from this point on, Tony, but essentially what happened was there was a bit of a disagreement about the insurance policy. The um, head or the um, director of the security company decided not to defend the action even though the insurance policy, there was a bit of a question mark over whether or not it covered it, whether or not it was going to cover what had happened. He then went on to not defend the case and the court entered what's called default judgment in favour of the injured person. Before that, I think what happened was this. When Mr. Nguyen sued Mr. Hiatus, the head contractor, um, they declined his uh, policy. That's right. They said, we're not going to indemnify you because you've been fraudulent, because you didn't tell us that you were conducting security services. That's right. So Mr. Hiatus eventually went bankrupt. And he said, well, look, if I'm bankrupt, they can't touch me, so I'm not going to defend the action. In their wisdom, Nuncio, QB Insurance decided not to tack on to the um, hearing to argue liability. And then what happened? Well, just again, backtrack, uh, the plaintiff tried to join QB, uh, but then the application was dismissed and QB probably thought that was the end of it, yep. uh, which in hindsight was a pretty poor move from their end. It was. Because then he did get default judgment um, for I think it was about $2.8 million. And then, which was a very smart move by the plaintiffs, uh, he was assigned the, the, basically the rights of the trustee in bankruptcy. Well, he went and did a deal with the trustee in bankruptcy yeah. and said, right, you assign the rights to the action of Mr. Hiotis to me, and they then sued the insurance company again. That's right. That's right. He essentially put himself in the shoes of the director of the security company, even though he was the injured person. Smart move because I got over the fraudulent misrepresentation uh, exclusion. It's a very smart move by the lawyers. Very smart move. And Tony, it's probably important for the viewers just to explain that default judgment occurs in the court when you go to court to sue someone and they don't engage lawyers to act on their behalf and the court enters what we call default judgment, which means that you automatically win your case. So that's what one of the real technical factors in this case that led to a whole lot of um, events following after, including the fact that the, the plaintiff ended up suing QBE directly because he put himself in the shoes of the director of the security company. Well, when Mr Nguyen took the proceeding against QBE, the court looked at the provisions of the policy mm. to see if it picked up the occurrence, that is, the event which led to his becoming yep. a paraplegic. Yep. And the court, and the court basically said, the policy did pick up those circumstances. Yeah, they thought that you know the the, the security services that were to be provided on the night and the failure to provide adequate security services because the context of the, the events is that the security didn't assist Mr. Newell whilst he was getting attacked. Uh, that it was regarded as an occurrence within the meaning of the business uh, and the business, I suppose, activities that were occurring. And so. They found against the insurance company and they ordered to pay that money. That's right. Plus interest and costs. That's right. And Tony, it's also important to let the viewers know that this occurred over, I think, nearly a 15-year period. So interest would have been a seriously significant part of this claim. And it, it's one of those situations where it's another words game. They were re- there was a lot of argument in the court about what exactly an occurrence was. Was it a positive act, so mm. somebody doing something, or could it also be someone failing to do something, an omission, for example. And because it, because it was an event or an occurrence within the activities of the business, the fact that the security guards weren't activated, essentially, to help out Mr Nguyen, the court found that that was an occurrence within the normal business activities because it was a security hmm. company after all. Doesn't it show that the courts have got a willingness to read these policies very, very broadly and liberally? Yeah, look, I think they're doing, I think they use the common sense, common sense approach, which, uh, which I obviously endorse and promote. And that was uh, um, apparent where QB tried, also tried to argue that legal liability in the, in the context of the policy uh, did not equate to default judgment. Well, no. of course it does. Uh, well, I just think it was <laughs> a very order. bad tactical error on the part of QBE not to defend the initial proceeding because in all probability, 
they might have not gotten over liability against the security company in the first place, Alice. Yes, that's right, Tony. To take it right back to the initial action, had QBE decided, despite their disagreements with M Mr Hiotis, to cover him for the purposes of the action, they may, the plaintiff would have found himself in what we might call a standard public liability dispute, where you say, well, you didn't help me, therefore that's negligent. And there is a chance, one way or another, you know, going to court can be a bit of a chance sort of a business, that they may not have found the security company liable, liable. and you would have but you would have admitted at the a same lot of time stuff. you know mr hiatus didn't get coverage from his insurer i don't think he would have been too willing to help him out to help him out to be honest that's exactly right and now they've sought special leave to try and relitigate the facts as they were but how's that going to help them if they didn't help mr hiatus the first time round. Why would he help the insurer? No. Uh, There's look, no skin off his nose. I think uh, QB is going to be uh, cutting a fairly big check. Yeah, I think yeah, it that's sounds that way to That's right. Now, let's look at the issue about these policies. Pretty, uh, privity of contract. What does it mean, Nuns? Well, basically, look, it's. Uh, most people, as I understand, is that there's only one sort of, there's parties to a contract, and if you're not a party to that contract, then you're not covered. But that's not always, a, the, not always the, I suppose, the game in insurance. That's Alice, right. what's your take on privity of contract? My take, Tony, is a little bit more as if you think about a contract as an agreement between person A and person B, generally speaking, if you haven't signed the contract or you're not a party to the agreement, then you can't get involved. But what we see with these cases we've just discussed is the courts seem to be open to the idea of including people who haven't necessarily signed up to the insurance policy. So a third party can get involved and get coverage. To afford protection. Yep. That's right. A good, I'll give you an example. Let's say you're on a building site. The head contractor's taken out insurance to cover all people on the site. Subbies, his own employees, etc., etc. If one of the subbies causes injury to one, some other person, they can rely on his contract to indemnify for any damages that may be awarded against him. Mm. Basically, that's what the courts are doing. And in fact, the Insurance Contracts Act 984, Commonwealth, was brought in to stop insurers from trying to um, hide Weasel out behind out. a privy of contract argument. Yeah. That's right. oh, look, it's similar to a case that we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll briefly touch on is that of Energise v Vero where uh, the manufacturer of these um, barbells tried to get uh, another company involved under the, the same form of insurance because they were, I think uh, they were deemed a subsidiary of the manufacturer. And, yes. Um, you know, the facts didn't stack up in that case, but the court was willing to, to make that exception if, if the facts did stack up. So... Well, the facts didn't stack up because they couldn't prove that the machine came into existence before the company that took out the policy of insurance come into existence. That's right. It was basically a disagreement about when the equipment was manufactured. And it seems that although the company had taken out insurance, they happened after the equipment mm. as opposed to before, which made it difficult for the for the gym company. But the courts do seem open to protecting people who've been injured. And if you can const construct your claim properly, you can often get there. So I think it's a really interesting area. We're getting to the end of the show. Guys, is anything you want to say to the viewers? Oh, look, just uh, if you've got any inquiries, I said seek legal advice because uh, you do have rights and, uh, you know, a lawyer can assist you with those rights. That's right. Yes. And a lot of people don't realise they are covered or that there is insurance out there for them. So it's worth speaking to a lawyer to work out whether or not what's happened to you is something you can do something about. Viewers, I want to thank you for watching this episode of The PI Show. Stay tuned for future episodes and also always stay safe. Thank you.